In this presentation, we are going to take a look at the book of Hebrews that Paul wrote to the Hebrew saints in Rome, and we'll do chapters 1 through 6. So here we'll start first with a little introduction. All followers of Jesus Christ will experience trials of their faith, and they may at times wonder if they should abandon their faith. The Epistle to the Hebrews was written to encourage a group of Christians to keep believing and not return to their former ways. Hebrews also shows the significance of many symbols found in the law of Moses and their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. For this reason, the book of Hebrews is an excellent scriptural guide to understanding Old Testament teachings and practices. While the scriptures are replete with references to Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice, his resurrection, and his ascension to heaven, Hebrews emphasizes the ongoing work of the Redeemer in the lives of all those who turn to him in obedience and faith. In some of his sermons and writings, the prophet Joseph Smith attributed statements from Hebrews to the Apostle Paul. A Christian tradition dating to the 2nd century A.D. holds that Paul was the author of the epistles to the Hebrews. In the 4th century A.D., Jerome added Paul's name to the title of Hebrews in his Latin translation of the Bible. Peter himself, a Hebrew whose ministry and teachings were directed in large part to his own people, seems to be identifying its authorship when he writes, Our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, the Hebrews, as also all his other epistles, some things hard to be understood. That's 2 Peter 3, 15-16. In the events Paul did write Hebrews, and to those who accept Joseph Smith as an inspired witness of truth, the matter is at rest, regardless of what the scholars think they know. Bruce R. McConkie writes, In Hebrews, as an inspired theologian, Paul takes the revelations of the past, the dead letter of the ancient law, and ties it into the living Christianity of the present. He shows how the gospel grew out of the preparatory law which prevailed in Israel and which in fact had its purpose and preparing of the way before the coming of that prophet who led Israel of old and was the author of both covenants. Above all, this epistle seems natural when addressed to a people who had looked forward to the delivering might of their Messiah a people who had great difficulty in accepting Jesus as their promised Redeemer. Above all else, this epistle is a witness of the divine sonship of him of whom the Jews had said, Is not this the carpenter's son? And so we find Paul teaching that the great God, the mighty Elohim, has a body of flesh and bones, and that his son, the Lord Jehovah, was in very deed born among men as the Son of God. We find him teaching that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, was the same personage who appeared to the Lord Jehovah on Sinai. In Hebrews we learn that Jesus was made a little lower than Elohim, that he has precedence over the angels, and that he took upon himself mortality to bring salvation to men. In Hebrews, our understanding is refreshed with the knowledge that salvation is available through his intercession, that he sacrificed himself for the sins of the world, that by his blood the saints are sanctified. In it, we are taught that the Mosaic ordinance prefigured his ministry, that his gospel was offered to ancient Israel, that he is the mediator of the new covenant. There is no other biblical source for detailed knowledge of the holy priesthood, of Christ's status as the great high priest and the apostle of our profession of the oath which God swore that his son would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And nowhere else in the Bible do we find the oath and covenant of the priesthood set forth, or that through this priesthood the gospel is administered, or that it is the power whereby eternal life is gained. 
Of course, the priesthood we are referring to after the order of the Son of God is the Melchizedek priesthood. And what of the heroes of faith, from Abel to Samuel, they are named, all of them, men whose mighty works were wrought by faith in that same being, the Lord Jehovah, whose power enabled Peter to say to man, to, to the man, lame from his mother's womb, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So and so this epistle stands giving doctrine and glory and knowledge, adding immeasurably to the understanding of the faithful. Interestingly, it did not find immediate and universal acceptance as a canonized work. Rome, in the person of Clement of Rome, originally received this epistle. Then followed a period in which it ceased to be received by the Roman churches. Then, in the 4th century, Rome retracted her error. As far as Rome is concerned, the epistles to the Hebrews was not only lost for three centuries, but never would have been recovered at all but for the Eastern churches. Think of the gospel knowledge that would not be available in the Christian world if we did not have the epistle of Paul, the apostle to his Hebrew brethren. Truly the Lord has preserved this priceless treasure for our blessing and benefit. Let's now turn our attention to chapter 1. The Son is in the expressed image of the Father. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. The preeminence of Jesus Christ. The epistle Jewish Christian audience was struggling with whether to return to their former Jewish ways. Therefore, it was important for them to hear that Jesus Christ is better than the angels because he is the Son of God and heir of all things and the creator of the worlds. In chapters 1 and 2, Paul cites eight successive quotes from the Old Testament to show that Jesus is greater than angels. To the Jews, Hebrews, angels were highly exalted beings because they were involved in giving the law at Sinai. Deuteronomy 33.2, Psalm 68.17, and Acts 7.53 discuss this. Apparently, some Jewish leaders even assigned angels a higher station than the Messiah. So these are some of the problems that are starting to creep into the church in Rome. These verses detail Paul, details Paul's understanding of the nature of the Godhead. The Father's word was spoken over the ages by the prophets, but recently the Father spoke directly by his Son, that same Son by whom he made the worlds. Notice the plural, worlds, not just world. Chapter 1, verse 1, God, phrase God, and 1, verse 2, his Son, meaning two personages of tabernacle and a third personage of the Spirit constitute the eternal Godhead. God the eternal Father is here separated from his Son as a personage, an entity, a holy and exalted man. Indeed, in the language of Adam, man of holiness is his name, and the name of his only begotten Son is the Son of Man. Even Jesus Christ, a righteous judge, shall come in the meridian of time. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 clearly show that Paul understood that the Godhood were three separate personages. Chapter 1, verse 1, the phrase, at sundry times, meaning at various times. God does not reveal himself at all times to all people in the literal sense of the world. He is or should be known to all people in all ages through the workmanship of his hands. But the actual revelation of himself and his laws is reserved for those who live by faith and seek him with all their hearts. Chapter 1, verse 1, the phrase, in diverse manners, how does God reveal himself? Through the ways, though the ways may be infinite, the perfect and crowning way is by the direct revelation by visions or personal visitations. According to the law of mediation and intercession which the Father himself ordained, he has chosen to reveal himself through the Son. 
ordaining that all revelation shall come through the Son, that through though that through though that holy personage frequently speaks in the Father's name by divine investiture of authority. That is, he speaks in the first person as though he were the Father, because the Father has placed his name upon the Son. You see that in many places of Scripture, where Christ speaks in first person as if he is the Father, because Heavenly Father has given him what's called that divine investiture. The sole reason for the personal appearance of the Father is to introduce the Son, as is literally illustrated by the appearance of the Father and the Son at the commencement of this dispensation. And hence the Bible statement, No man hath seen God at any time except he hath bore record of the Son. That's from the Joseph Smith translation of John 1.19. Christ the Son is, of course, the God of Israel, through whom the will of the Father was manifest to that chosen people. Chapter 1, verse 2, the phrase, spoken unto us by his Son. The perfect revelation of God came in the meridian of time, whereas in previous ages he had been known by revelation to the holy prophets. In time's meridian he sent his Son into the world, that so that all men seeing the Son could inversion perfectly who and what the Father is. The four Gospels contain the most comprehensive, comprehensive revelation of God the Father of any scripture because they show what kind of being the Son is, and men knowing the Son thereby know the Father. That's how one they are. That's how Christ, or the Father, reveals himself, by sending his Son down. Our Lord said, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, John 14, 9. For God was in Christ, revealing himself to the world. The phrase, heir of all things, meaning, as his Son, Christ is the natural heir of the Father. All things that the Father hath are mine, he said, John 16:15. In similar vein, those who through faith are adopted into the family of God and Father become joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 17, and receive our Lord's promise, all that my Father hath shall be given unto them. The phrase in verse 2, by whom also he made the worlds, Christ under the Father is the creator of all things. The word of the Father spoken to Moses by the Son in accordance with the principle of divine investiture of authority states, Worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for my own purpose, and by the Son I created them, which is my only begotten Son. Moses 1.33. So here is a good example of Christ speaking in first person for the Father. See, it sounds like this is the Father speaking, but it's Jesus Christ speaking in verse person for Heavenly Father by divine investiture. Chapter uh, 1, verse 3, the phrase, the brightness of his glory, his power. In preexistence, Christ was like unto God, Abraham 3.24, thus possessing the power and glory of the Father. While yet dwelling in his premortal sphere, he was the Lord omnipotent who reigneth, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity. Mosiah 3 5. And now raised in glorious immortality, he has attained the state for which he prayed in the great antecessary prayer. This is from John 17 5. O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was, thus being able to affirm anew, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Chapter 1, verse 3, the phrase, Jesus Christ is in the express image of his Father. The term express image comes from the Greek word character, character 
which refers to a representation or reproduction of something else, such as the impression a signet ring leaves on soft wax. This phrase in Hebrews 1.3 indicates that Jesus Christ is a representation of Heavenly Father and shares his divine character. God the Eternal Father is the Father, the Son of God is the Son. A father is a father, and a son is a son. The father begets, the son is begotten. They are parent and child. Sire and son look alike so much that they are the express image of each other's person. I believe it was at one time Joseph Smith said that it takes the Holy Ghost to know the difference between the two. They are so much alike in appearance and action. The substance composing the body of one is identical in appearance to that composing the body of the other. What could be plainer? Elder Jeffrey R. Harland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that Jesus being an express image of his Father is a witness to both the ancient and modern world of what God the Father is like. Quote, of course, the centuries long drift away from belief in such a perfect and caring father hasn't been helped by any, by the man-made creeds of erring generations which describe God variously as unknown and unknowable, formless, passionless, elusive, ethereal, simultaneously everywhere and nowhere at all. Certainly that does not describe the being we behold through the eyes of these prophets, nor does it match the living, breathing, embodied Jesus of Nazareth, who was and is in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his Father. In that sense, Jesus did not come to improve God's view of man nearly so much as he came to improve man's view of of God. End of quote by Elder Holland. Chapter 1, verse 3, the phrase, purge our sins, through his atoning sacrifice coupled with repentance and baptism on our part. That is to say, the Almighty God gave his only begotten Son as is written in those scriptures which have been given of him. He suffered temptation but gave no heed unto them. He was crucified, died, and rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven to sit down on the right hand of the Father, to reign with the almighty power according to the will of the Father, that as many as would believe and be baptized in his holy name and endure in faith to the end should be saved. Doctrine and Covenants 20, 21-25 Chapter 1, verse 4, the phrase, the angels, other members of the family of God the Father, who have a lower status on a lower rank of Christ. Like I said in Rome, they were struggling with this and thinking that angels had the higher rank. They include the spirits and pre-existence, translated beings, and resurrected personages. Those are three different categories angels can come in. Hebrews Chapter 1, verses 5 through 13, and chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, are quotations from the Old Testament. Several verses in Hebrews teach the importance of Jesus Christ in God's plan by drawing upon the following, upon the following Old Testament references. Psalms 2, 7, see Hebrews 1, 5. Psalms 8, 4 through 6, see Hebrews 2, 6 through 8. Psalms 45, 6 through 7, see Hebrews 1, 8 through 9. Psalms 102, 25 through 27, see Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. Psalms 104, verse 4, see Hebrews 1, 7. And Psalms 110, verse 1, see Hebrews 1, 13. Using Old Testament quotations in this epistle to Jewish Christians would have added authority to its reasoning and doctrinal teachings. So you can see in these verses, Paul is quoting from the books of Psalms to teach them about the reality of Christ. 
to gain the full impact of Saul's inspired reasoning about Christ and angels, scriptural exegists must first know, as did those Hebrew saints to whom the world were originally addressed, that, one, there is an eternal and infinite family in heaven and on earth to whom all beings of every rank, status, and position belong. Number two, God the eternal Father, the mighty Elohim, is the parent and father of all. Number three, Christ is the firstborn spirit son in the eternal family. And while yet in preexistence, he advanced and progressed and became like the father, the father in power and intelligence. That is, he became a god even while in preexistence. No wonder we honor and worship him and stand all amazed. Number four, as contrasted with the power, glory, and dominion of Christ, all the other spirit children in the eternal family are or were angels of God, most of whom obeyed the Father and served Christ, but one-third of whom revealed, rebelled, followed Lucifer, followed Lucifer, and were cast down to earth without tangible bodies to remain forever as angels to the devil." Number five, mortal men, though spirit children of God, are temporarily housed in tabernacles of clay. And Christ our Lord, dwelling in mortality, was the only begotten in the flesh. That is, he was the only spirit offspring of the Father who was born into mortality with God as his earthly father. And then we would add, as Mary, as his mortal mother. Number six, translated and resurrected beings continue to serve as angels, pending the day when some of them will be crowned with the glory of his might and made equal with Christ. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 107. Number seven, angels serve the Father and the Son and minister on their errand. Whether such angels are spirit beings as Gabriel, who came to Zacharias, or translated beings as Moses and Elijah, who appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, or resurrected beings as Moroni, who ministered to Joseph Smith. Chapter 1, verse 5, the phrase, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee, is quoted from Psalms 2-7, meaning, Thou art my son, my firstborn in the spirit, my only begotten in the flesh, begotten. The phrase begotten means begotten. It means Christ's mortal body was procreated by an eternal sire. It means God is the father of Christ after the manner of the flesh. As far as I know, I think we're the only church that teaches that. The others, Christ and the Son, are the same one essence, being, substance, whatever in the universe that makes no sense. Father, eternal Father in heaven, is literally the Father of the Son of God after the manner of the flesh. Hebrews 1, 6 and verse 14, all the angels of God worship him, him referring to his Christ. The angels of God worship Jesus Christ, our spirit children of our Heavenly Father. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews 1.7 indicates that angels are ministering spirits. See the footnote for Hebrews 1.6, footnote B. Hebrews 1.14 teaches that in our Father's plan, one of the purposes of these angels or ministering spirits is to minister to his children on the earth. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland stated, I believe we need to speak of and believe in and bear testimony to the ministry of angels more than we sometimes do. They constitute one of God's great methods of witnessing through the veil. End of quote. Brother Bruce C. Hafen, who later became a member of the Seventy, pointed out that angelic ministrations can be either seen or unseen. Quote, Some of these personal visits were dramatic and powerful. 
Think of the evangels who ministered to the Nephite children in the account of 3 Nephi 17, or the angel who assisted Alma and Mosiah's sons in answer to a father's prayer. Other personal manifestations have been so quiet that those who received them were unaware of the angelic presence. The ministry of these unseen angels is among the most sublime forms of interaction between heaven and earth, powerfully expressing God's concern for us and bestowing tangible assurance and spiritual sustenance upon those in great need. End of quote. Chapter 1, verse 7. This quote is from Psalms 104.4, which holds which whole psalm recites that the Lord God, who is Christ, is very great and gives as one of the proofs his dominion over and the power he gives to his angels. Chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. These majestic words are quoted from Psalms 45, 6 through 7, where the messianic prophecy also describes our Lord as fairer than the children of man. Verse 2, and then gives inspired imitations of his family relationships. Intimations, I'm sorry, of his family relationships. Chapter 1, verses 10 through 10, recorded in Psalms 102, 25 through 26, relative to the Lord, thus showing, as do the quotations of this type, that the Lord of the Old Testament is, is the Christ of the New Testament. Chapter 1, verse 13, recorded in Psalms 110, verse 1, with the introductory phrase, The Lord said to my Lord, thus showing, as do other quotations of this type, that the Old Testament prophets understood there were two lords who were the Father and the Son. Chapter 1, verse 14, Ministering Spirits, that this term embraces all angelic ministrants, whether spirit beings or resurrected personages, is seen from the fact that the inhabitants of the telestial kingdom shall be ministered to by those from the terrestrial kingdom by angels who are appointed to minister for them, or who are appointed to be ministering spirits for them, for they shall be heirs of salvation." Doctrine and Covenants 76, 87 through 88. We now turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Jesus came to suffer death and save mankind. Hebrews 2 verses 1 through 4, the argument here is this. The law was given anciently by the disposition of angels. You can see that in Acts 7 Verse 53, and Moses was ordained by the hand of angels to be the mediator of this first covenant, the law. That's in the Joseph Smith translation of Galatians 3, 19. But the gospel came in the meridian of time from the Lord himself, who ordained apostles to bear witness of his name, and their witness has been confirmed with signs and miracles. Now, if our fathers were condemned for transgressing and disobeying the law which came from angels through Moses, how much greater shall he shall our condemnation if we fail to live the gospel which came from the Lord himself through apostles and prophets? Chapter 2, verse 5, angels hold positions of power and authority in the world to come. Thus, those who gain eternal life must pass by the angels and the gods which are set there if they are to gain their exaltation and glory. Doctrine and Covenants 132.19 Hebrews 2 verses 6 through 9, a little lower than the angels, that phrase. Paul drew upon a messianic prophecy from Psalms 8 verses 4 through 6 when he stated in Hebrews 2 9 that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. Christ condescended from his pre mortal throne and came to earth so that he could experience mortality with its physical restrictions. The marginal reading of this quotation from Psalms 4, I mean 8, 4 through 6, recite that man is made 
not a little lower than the angels, but a little lower than Elohim, which means that all God's offspring, Jesus included, as children in his family, are created subject to him with, to, with the power to advance until all things are in subjection to them. Of those who gain eternal life, it is written, quoting DNC 132.20, Then shall they be above all, because all things are subject unto them. Then shall they be gods, because they have all power, and the angels are subjected unto him. That is the whole purpose of our mortal experience, is that we can gain all power and be above all things as Christ and the Father are. Hebrews 2.9, the only sense in which either man or Jesus are lower than the angels is in that mortal restrictions limit them for the moment, and for that matter, angels themselves become mortal, and then in the resurrection again, attain again their angelic status. Hebrews 2.10 and then 14-18, he is able to succor them that are tempted. These verses in Hebrew to explain that because Jesus Christ lived as a mortal and experienced the trials and temptations of mortality, he is able to help us as we face our own trials and temptations. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland described why Jesus is able to succor those who are tempted. Quote, when Christ bids us to yield, to submit, to obey the Father, he knows how to help us to do that. He has walked that way, asking us to do what he has done. He has made it safer. He has made it very much easier for our travel. He knows where the sharp stones and the stumbling blocks lie, and where the thorns and the thistles are most severe. He knows where the path is perilous, and he knows which way to go when the road forks and nightfall comes. He knows this because he has suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, that he may know how to succor his people according to their infirmities. To succor means to run to. Christ will run to us and is running even now if we will but receive and extend arm of his and receive the extended arm of his mercy. Isn't that a beautiful phrase to know that Christ runs to us? Brothers and sisters, we just need to be willing to accept him. Continuing his quote, those who stagger or stumble, he is there to steady and strengthen us. In the end, he is there to save us, and for all this, he gave his life. However dim our days may seem, they have been a lot darker for the Savior of the world. End of quote. Oh, I'm sure we can never probably comprehend how dark the days in Gethsemane and the cross were for the Savior. On another occasion, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland wrote of Christ's compassion and ability to help us, quote, Christ walked the path every mortal is called to walk so that he would know how to succor and strengthen us in our most difficult times. He knows the deepest and most personal burdens we carry. He knows the most public and poignant pains we bear. He descended below all such grief in order that he might lift us above it. There is no anguish or sorrow or sadness in life that he has not suffered in our behalf and borne away upon his own valiant and compassionate shoulders. End of quote. Hebrews 2, verse 10, The Savior was made perfect through suffering. Why a suffering Savior? The important answer is given in Hebrews 2, 18 and chapter 4, verse 15. He can judge us because he knows the desires of the flesh. He can relate to our infirmities because he, too, has lived through mortality. Truly, he has, was made like unto us in all things, Hebrews 2, 17, so that he would know how to nurture us. Hebrews 2, verses 11 through 13 
Verse 11, the phrase, he that sanctifieth, Christ through the shedding of whose blood men are sanctified. For by the water ye keep the commandments, by the spirit ye are justified, and by the blood ye are sanctified. Moses chapter 6, verse 60. The phrase, they who are sanctified, meaning faithful members of the church. The phrase, all are, I'm sorry, the phrase are all of one, meaning are all the spirit children of God, the eternal Father. And the phrase brethren, meaning Christ, is our elder brother. All men are brothers and sisters in the spirit. All have the same eternal Father. Verse 12, as found in our Bible, the Messianic prophecy here quoted reads, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee, Psalms 22, 22. Interestingly, the Old Testament expression congregation is quoted by Paul as church, thus indicating that he knew, as the Book of Mormon also testified, that there was an organized church in Old Testament times. See 1 Nephi 4, 24-27 for more information on that. Verse 13, the phrase, I will put my trust in him, is, this is a phrase of a part of a great declaration by David about the Lord Jehovah. The use of which here equates Jehovah and Christ as one and the same. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. High, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Second Samuel 22, verses 2 through 4. When he calls him the horn of our salvation, horn anciently represented power. Animals that had horns were more powerful than those that did not. So when it says Christ is the horn of our salvation, he is the power of our salvation. He has the power to save us and exalt us. In the phrase in verse 13, I and the children which God hath given me is quoted from Isaiah 8.18. To show that when God gives children to men on earth, he is simply sending them his own spirit offspring. Chapter 2, verse 16, the seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham refers not only to literal blood lineage descendants of Abraham, but also to all those who enter the gospel covenant, Hebrew 2.16. Those who are holy of Gentile lineage, when they are converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ and are baptized, are adopted into the lineage of Abraham. Doctrine and Covenants 132, 31-32 explains that the promises made to Abraham extend to his seed today. Hebrews 2.17 the purpose of Christ's mortality was to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, that is, to make atonement for him. The Hebrew term for reconciliation is kapura, from which comes kapur, as in yom kapur, meaning atonement. Let's now go to Hebrews chapter 3. Christ is the apostle and high priest of our profession. Hebrews 3, 1 through 6, Jesus Christ is greater than Moses. For the Jews, Moses was the most highly revered prophet, the one whom received God's law at Sinai. The Jewish Christians being addressed in Hebrews are contemplating abandoning their faith in Christ and returning to Judaism in an attempt to remain loyal to the law of Moses. They did not understand or believe deeply enough that Christ was preeminent to Moses. Having shown in Hebrews 1 through 2 that Jesus Christ is greater than the angels, Paul next explained that as the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus is greater than Moses and all his laws. Hebrews 3 1. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles pointed out one reason that Christ was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Quote, 
Christ is the tree, chief minister of salvation for men on earth, in that through his atoning sacrifice, salvation itself comes. Hebrew 3, 3-6 three through six, teaches further about Jesus Christ's superiority to Moses, stating that Moses was a servant in God's house, but Christ built and rules over the house as God's son. As the Hebrew saints knew, the Lord's house anciently was his people, his congregation, his saints, concerning which he said, My servant Moses is faithful in all my house. Numbers 12.7 now Paul is saying that the Meridian saints are the Lord's house, among whom is Christ the Lord, who excels even Moses in glory and greatness. Moses was the servant in the house for his day and age, but Christ is the Son who made the house and whose it is. Chapter 3, verse 1, the phrase, Wherefore, consider... In the light of all this that is said in the first two chapters of Hebrew, that Christ is the Son, that he is preeminent over the angels, that he became mortal to work out the infinite and eternal atonement, and through him man is reconciled to God, let us now consider him and his doctrine. The phrase holy brother meaning faithful members of the church who, as the subsequent presentations show, held the Melchizedek priesthood. The phrase, the heavenly calling, meaning the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the calling from God through which eternal life is granted. The apostle, meaning Christ, who was and is his own chief witness, who testifies plainly to the fullness of all ages, I am the Son of God. High priest, meaning Christ, is the great high priest, Adam, next. That is, Christ is the chief minister of salvation of men on earth, in that through his atoning sac sacrifice, salvation itself comes. Our faith and our gospel, the phrase our profession means our faith, our gospel, our priesthood. Hebrews 3, 7-15, through 15, the importance of hearing Christ's voice today. Quoting from Psalms 95, 7 through 11, Paul encouraged the saints in Hebrews 3, 7 through 15 to act in faith immediately, today, by listening to the Lord's voice, by exhorting one another, by avoiding unbelief and sin, and by not being hard in heart. Become hardened and unable to enter in the Lord rest stems from disobeying the Lord. Note its perfect fit with modern revelation in which we learn that the rest of the Lord is the fullness of his glory. We read in Doctrine and Covenants 84, 20 through 26, and this greater priesthood administer the gospel and holdeth the keys of the ministry of the kingdom, even the key of the knowledge of God, the greater priesthood meaning the Melchizedek, going back to the, the, the verse. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, meaning the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood, which would be the temple, the power of godliness is manifest. And without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto the men in the flesh. For without this, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. Probably meaning living in their presence. Now this Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. But they, Israel, hardened their hearts and could not enter his presence. Therefore the Lord in his wrath, with just all that means is the righteous use of justice, for the Lord in his wrath, for his anger was killed, kindled against him, so meaning injustice, swore that they should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness. They were not ready for the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood, which rest is the fullness of his glory. Therefore he took Moses out of their midst and the holy priesthood also, and the lesser priesthood continued, which priesthood holdeth the key of the ministry of angels and the preparatory gospel. 
Elder Donald L. Halstrom of the Presidency of the Seventy spoke of the danger of procrastinating spiritual matters. Many of us place ourselves in circumstances far more, far more consequential than embarrassment because of our procrastination to become fully converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know what is right, but we dreadfully but we delay full spiritual involvement because of laziness, fear, rationalization, or lack of faith. We convince ourselves that someday I'm going to do it. However, for many, someday never comes. And even for others who eventually do make a change, there is an in irretrievable loss of progress and surely regression. End of quote. Hebrews 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 7 through 11, quoted from Psalms 95, 7 through 11. These verses testify that when the Lord offers his saving truths to a people, such as the day and time of their salvation, the day and time when they can do the things necessary to ensure themselves of a celestial inheritance, if they reject the proffered saving truths, as did ancient Israel, they fall short of the glory and reward which otherwise would have been theirs. Chapter 3, verse 7, the phrase, as the Holy Ghost saith, the Holy Ghost revealed the Psalms to these various authors. God's word is given by the Holy Ghost, and the very personage here quoted, though originally revealed by the Holy Ghost to David, is spoken in first person as the voice of the Lord. Similarly, the scriptures say of one of the great spiritual experiences of the first man, quote, and in that day the Lord, I'm sorry, the Holy Ghost fell upon Adam, which beareth record of the Father and the Son, saying, I am the only begotten of the Father from the beginning and henceforth and forever. End of quote, Moses 5, 9. Chapter 3, verse 12, the phrase, an evil heart of unbelief, for the saints to fail to believe the truths offered to them is sin. Verse 13, the phrase, why it is called today, Paul is meaning the period during which the gospel is offered to a people. In our day, the Lord says, now is the call, now it is called today until the coming of the Son of Man. Chapter 3, verse 13, the phrase partakers of Christ means partakers of the full gospel blessings on par with our Lord, thus having the mind of Christ and being joint heirs with him and fully being made equal with him. Chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, ancient Israel failed to enter into the rest of the Lord because of unbelief. See Hebrews 4, 1 through 2. They were not ready for the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood, and therefore they had to have a lower law to prepare them and point their way to Christ, even the law of Moses. Hebrews 3, verses 16 through 19, and also for chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, entering into God's rest. The people of ancient Israel provoked the Lord to anger and were therefore not allowed to enter into the Lord's rest, which was symbolically represented by the land of Canaan. Now remember, when it says they provoked the Lord to anger, it means they kept the Lord from blessing them with the Melchizedek priesthood because they were not ready. He's not fuming at the mouth and steam coming out his ears, and he's angry and yelling. It's just saying justice says he's exercising true justice by not allowing them to enter to the rest of the Melchizedek priesthood and the ordinance of the temple because it would have condemned them. Jabal Musa, traditionally regarded as Mount Sinai, during ancient Israel's wilderness journey near Mount Sinai, Israel provoked the Lord to anger, meaning kept the Lord from giving them the Melchizedek priesthood and its ordinances. In Latter-day Revelation, the Lord defined his rest as the fullness of his glory. President Joseph F. Smith taught that there is also a sense in which we might enter into the Lord's rest while in mortality. Quote, the ancient prophets speak of entering to God's rest. What does it mean? 
To my mind, it means entering into the knowledge and love of God, having faith in his purposes and in his plan, to such an extent that we know we are right and that we are not hunting for something else. We are not disturbed by every wind of doctrine or by the cunning and craftiness of men who lie in wait to deceive. The man who has reached that degree of faith in God, that all doubt and fear have been cast from him, he has entered into God's rest. I pray that we may all enter into God's rest. Rest from doubt, from fear, from apprehension of danger. Rest from the religious turmoil of the world. End of quote. Hebrews chapter 4, the gospel is offered to ancient Israel. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, the Bruce R. McConkie explains why ancient Israel failed to enter into God, the rest of God, which Paul was concerned that some in the church then were coming short of. Quote, God gave the fullness of the gospel to Israel, but they rejected this perfect law of liberty and progression and were left with the preparatory gospel only. Moses, in righteous anger at the false worship of the Israel, broke the first tablets of stone which were written with the finger of God. Thereafter the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two other tablets of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon them. Also the words of the law, according as they were written at the first on the tablets which thou breakest. But it shall not be according to the first, for I will take away the priesthood, the Melchizedek, out of their midst. Therefore my holy order and the ordinances thereof shall not go before them, meaning the ordinances of the Melchizedek priest that found in the temple. For my presence shall not go up in their midst, lest I destroy them. But I will give unto them the law as at first, but it shall be after the law of carnal commandment. For I have sworn in my wrath that they shall not enter into my presence, into my rest, in the days of their pilgrimage. That's from the Joseph Smith translation of Exodus 34, verses 1 through 2. From latter-day revelation, we learn that Moses taught Israel plainly the things they must do to sanctify themselves, to gain the full blessings of the gospel, and to see the face of God. But they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence. Therefore the Lord in his wrath, or in his justice, for his angels were kindled against them, swore that they should not enter his rest while in the wilderness, which rest is the fullness of his glory." Therefore he took Moses out of their midst, and the holy priesthood also. And the lesser priesthood continued, which priesthood holdeth the key of the ministering of angels, and the preparatory gospel, which gospel is the gospel of repentance and of baptism, and the remission of sins, and the law of carnal commandments, which the Lord in his wrath caused to continue with the house of Aaron among the children of Israel until John. End of Elder McConkie's quote. Israel could have been sanctified and entered into the fullness of God's glory, meaning his rest, because they forfeited this blessing through disobedience. For Latter-day Israel, the promise still stands and may be obtained if we are wiser and more obedient than ancient Israel. Hebrews 4 verses 2 through 3, combining the word of God with faith. One reason the first generation of Israelites in the wilderness failed to enter the promised land is that they hardened their hearts. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews three, uh, Hebrews 4, verse 3, see footnote A, highlights what will happen if we do not harden our hearts. If they harden their hearts, they shall not enter into my rest. Also, I have sworn, if they will not harden their hearts, they shall enter into my rest, although the works of God were prepared or finished from the foundation of the world. Another reason they failed to enter the promised land was they failed to combine hearing the word with faith. They did not live the teachings. It's one to hear it, it's another to do it. 
Brother A. Roger Merrill, while serving as general president of the Sunday School, explained one process that might describe what it means to join the Word of God with faith. Quote, In our church meetings and our personal family scripture study, and even as we listen to the Lord's prophets and apostles, some of us will receive more than others. Why? I am learning that those who truly receive do at least three things that others may not do. First, they seek. We live in an entertainment world, a spectator world. Without realizing it, we can find ourselves coming to conference or going to church with the attitude, here I am, now inspire me, we become spiritually passive. When we focus instead on seeking and receiving the Spirit, we become less concerned about a teacher or speaker holding our attention and more concerned about giving our attention to the Spirit. Remember, receive is a verb. It is a principle of action. It is a fundamental expression of faith. Second, those who receive fill. While revelation comes to the mind and heart, it is most often felt. Until we learn to pray, pay attention to these spiritual feelings, we usually do not even recognize the Spirit. Third, those who receive by the Spirit intend to act. As the prophet Moroni instructed, to receive a witness of the Book of Mormon, we must ask with real intent. The Spirit teaches when we honestly intend to do something about what we learn. If we're not going to act upon anything that's taught in Sunday school lessons or in sacrament meetings, then you are not going to fill the Spirit if you have no intention of, of acting upon the gospel truth that the Holy Ghost witnesses of. End of quote. Hebrews 4, uh, verses 4 and 10. God did rest the seventh day. The Sabbath day is the sign and symbol of the rest of the Lord. Those who have entered into gospel rest keep the Sabbath day holy as part of their righteous conduct and true worship. On that day they rest from their worldly labors as God did from his creative enterprises as a sign and testimony that they have entered into the rest of the Lord in their life have testimony to the gospel, and look forward to the rest of the Lord, which rest is the fullness of the, his glory hereafter. Thus why Jehovah says in Exodus 31, 12 through 17, quote, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily keep my Sabbaths, verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it, keeping the Sabbath day holy, is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord to sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doth and work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. And that is true today. Those who do not keep the Sabbath day are put to death spiritually. They die spiritual death and lack the spirit. Back to the scripture. Six days my work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord, whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation for a perpetual covenant. And then he again he repeats, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Brothers and sisters, how well we keep the Sabbath day is a sign on what we think of Christ. We are signal, signaling to him what we think of him and of his kingdom and of his church. Hebrews 4, verses 6 through 9. Verse 5, there is still the opportunity for Israel today to enter into God's rest as seen in Joseph Smith's translation of Hebrews 4, 5, footnote A. And in this place again, if they harden not their hearts, they shall enter into my rest. Verse 6, Paul was saying Israel was offered gospel rest, but they failed to gain it. Verse 7, Paul is saying, Thereafter, through David, the Lord again promised they as a people should yet obtain his rest, while, which Moses and Joshua had not been able to give them. Verse 8, 
Paul is saying if they enter into Canaan under Joshua had been the fulfillment of the divine promise of rest, there would have been no mentions centuries later in Psalms of a rest still remaining. Hence, there remained a rest for the people of God. So them entering into Canaan was not entering into the rest because they were still under the law of Moses. Verse 9, Paul is saying, Now finally the promised day has come with the restoration of the gospel by the Lord Jesus. Hebrews 4, 11 through 14, verse 11, Let us labor, therefore, to enter to his rest, meaning only the faithful members of the church enter into the rest of the Lord. This rest is the companion of a pure testimony of the divinity of the Lord's work and carries with it the hope of eternal life in the world to come. To his obedient saints, the Lord promises, I will give you rest. You shall find rest to your souls. Verse 12, the phrase quick and powerful, meaning lie living and active. It does not die when uttered, but continues vital and operative, and like a sharp sword, penetrates to the innermost recesses of the heart and life. That these spiritual impressions can sink into the heart with a power transcending anything earthly is shown from the Joseph Smith statement, quote, Thus saith the still small voice, which whispereth through and pierceth all things, and oft times it maketh my bones to quake, while it maketh manifest. DNC 85.6 The phrase a discerner meaning quick to discern, literally critical, that is, able to judge. There is none else save God that... There is none else save God that knoweth thy thoughts and the intents of thy heart. Verse 13, the phrase, all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him, means, in effect, there is an all-seeing eye. God sees and knows all things. Verse 14, the phrase, into the heavens. The Revised Translation says, through the heavens. In Jewish theology, there were, se there were several heavens. See 2 Corinthians 12, 2. Jesus has passed through all the outer courts into the Holy of Holies. He occupies the holiest place in, he in heaven. Hebrews 1, 3. Let us hold fast our profession, that is, endure to the end, pressing forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God of all men. Wherefore, if you shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Not maybe, not might, ye shall have eternal life. Hebrews 4, verses 15 through 16, the Savior knows our infirmities and can help us in a time of need. While serving in the presidency of the 70, Elder Merrill J. Bateman taught that the atonement was an intimate, personal experience through which Jesus Christ came to know perfectly how to help each of us. Quote, For many years I thought of the Savior's experience in the garden and on the cross as places where a large mass of sin was heaped upon him. Through the words of Alma, Abinadi, Isaiah, and other prophets, however, my view has changed. Instead of an impersonal mass of sin, there was a long line of people. As Jesus felt our infirmities, bore our griefs, caroled our sorrows, and was bruised for our iniquities. The pearl of great price teaches that Moses was shown all the inhabitants of the earth, which are numberless as the sands upon the seashore. If Moses beheld every soul, then it seems reasonable that the creator of the universe has the power to become intimately acquainted with each of us. He learned about your weaknesses and mine. He experienced your pains and sufferings. He experienced mine. I testify that he knows. He understands the way in which we deal with temptations. He knows our weaknesses. But more than that, more than just knowing us, he knows how to help us if we come to him in faith. End of quote. Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles concluded that, quote, 
we can turn to him because he understands. He understands the struggle, and he also understands how to win the struggle. Most importantly, we may look to Jesus to help restore the inner unity of our soul when we have succumbed to sin and destroyed our peace. End of quote. Chapter 4, verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly, Come boldly unto the throne of grace means this is one of the great promises in all of the New Testament for obtaining help as our confidence wax strong in the presence of God through virtuous living we may approach the throne of grace boldly and receive help which God knows is best for us. In many ancient cultures to approach a king's throne uninvited was to risk one's life. But at the king's invitation, one could approach and speak with assurance. To approach God boldly means having confidence that God wants us to approach his throne, that we will receive his help. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, quote, It is pleasing to that God whose we are when we fast and pray and seek his blessings, when we plead with all the energy of our souls for those things we so much desire, when we, as Paul say, says, we come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. End of quote. Chapter 5. Ministers must be called of God as was Aaron. Hebrews 5, 1 through 4, call of God as was Aaron. Chapter 5, verse 1, sacrifices for sin phrase means the priests in Israel offered sacrifices for the sins of the people. Verse 2, inferring to the priest in Israel, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is subject to weaknesses. See, the priests in Israel had to even offer animal sacrifice for their own sins and for the people. This is why Christ was above those priests. Christ does not have to offer sacrifice because he had no sin. 5 verse 3, the priests in Israel had to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. In this respect, Christ might not seem to resemble the Levitical priest. Yet as he took on as he took our sin upon him, there is a sense in which he offered sacrifice for himself with us. Christ sacrificed himself for the sins of the people. Sins are forgiven in and through his atoning sacrifice and in no other way. Chapter 5, verse 4, as was Aaron. Paul noted that Jesus received his authority from God the Father just as other Aaron and other ancient high priests were called of God and received their priesthood by proper authority rather than taking the honor of the calling upon themselves. As the article of faith 1 through 5 states, we believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy and by the laying on of hands by those who have authority to preach the gospel and administer in the ordinances thereof. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, quote, We believe that no man can administer salvation through the gospel to the souls of men in the name of Jesus Christ, except he is authorized from God by revelation or by being ordained by someone whom God hath sent by revelation. Hebrew 5, 4 states, And no man taketh this honor to himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. And I would ask, how was Aaron called? But by revelation, end of quote. Aaron was called of God by revelation to serve as the high priest who represented the people of God in sacred matters and presided over the priesthood holders, the Levites. His calling came from God through a revelation to Moses, quote, and take upon thee Aaron thy brother, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, Exodus 28.1. After the time of Aaron, the high priest, was selected from among the priestly families descended from Aaron and his sons. In ancient Israel, the office of high priest was an office in the Aaronic priesthood and was comparable to the office of presiding bishop of the church in our day. 
Aaron's sons and other Levites performed many tasks, including serving in the tabernacle, conducting the morning and evening sacrifices in the tabernacle, and later in Jerusalem's temple, keeping watch over the fire of the sacred altar and teaching the people of Israel the commandments. He was 5'5", Christ made an high priest. Christ and others held the priesthood in pre-existence. Adam, the prophet says, obtained it in the creation before the world was. That's from the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 157. But as pertaining to his mortal ministry, Christ our Lord received the Melchizedek priesthood here on earth and was ordained to the office of a high priest therein, thus setting an example for others and being in all things the prototype of salvation. With reference to the mortal receipt of that holy order which is his, and which he has afore used to create this and an infinite number of other worlds, and which he had, in fact, given to Melchizedek in the first instance, the prophet says, meaning Joseph Smith, if a man gets a fullness of the priest of God, he has to get it in the same way that Jesus Christ obtained it. And that was by keeping all the commandments and obeying all the ordinances of the house of the Lord. Both the Old and New Testament show that priesthood holders received the priesthood through being ordained by an authorized holder of the priesthood. This practice continues in the church today. President Boyd K. Packer, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught, quote, The priesthood cannot be conferred like a diploma. It cannot be handed to you as a certificate. It cannot be delivered to you as a message or sent to you in a letter. It comes only by proper ordination. An authorized holder of the priesthood has to be there. He must place his hands upon your head and ordain you. End of quote. Hebrews 5, 5 through 6, Thou art my son. In Hebrews 5 through 6, Paul is quoting Psalms 2, 7 and Psalms 1, 10, 4. Hebrews 5, 7 through 8, learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Elder Bruce R. McCarthy explained that Hebrews 5 through 7, 7, verses 7 through 8, pertains to both Jesus Christ and to Melchizedek. Verses 7 and 8 apply to both Melchizedek and to Christ because Melchizedek was a prototype of Christ and the prophet's ministry typified and foreshadowed that of our Lord in the same sense that the minister of Moses did. Thus, through the words of these verses, and particularly those in verse 7, had original application to Melchizedek, they apply with equal and perhaps even greater force to the life and ministry of him through whom all the promises made to Melchizedek were fulfilled. End of Elmer McConkie's quote. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency taught that Jesus Christ is the perfect example of obedience and identified a key attitude that will help us learn to be obedient. Quote, as in all things, the Savior is our power, pattern. The Apostle Paul wrote, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. He was 5'8". In our own finite way, we too can learn obedience, even as Christ did. When obedience becomes our goal, it is no longer an irritation. Instead of a stumbling block, it becomes a building block. Hebrews 5, 8 through 9, learning through suffering. President Harold B. Lee taught that the Savior's suffering prepared him to be the author of salvation and that we are refined by the things we suffer. Quote, there is a refining process that comes through suffering, I think, that we can't experience in any way than by suffering. We draw closer to him who gave his life that man might be. We feel a kinship that we have never felt before. He suffered more than we can ever imagine, but to the extent that we have suffered, somehow it seems to have the effect of drawing us closer to the divine, helps us to purify our souls, and helps to purge out the things that are not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. End of quotation. Presently further taught 
that suffering has a necessary purpose. Quote, a young mother went through the trying experience of having a little child who was killed in an accident, and she came and sought a blessing for comfort. She asked through her tears, must there always be pain in this life? I thought a few minutes and then said, the apostle said of the master, the Lord and Savior, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he so suffered. I suppose that the answer is yes. There must always be pain in this life of travail and sorrow, and there is purpose in it all. End of quote. And we will only learn that purpose if we will turn to the Savior during our suffering. Hebrews 5, 9, being made perfect. Christ always was perfect in that he obeyed the whole law of the Father at all times and was everlastingly the sinless one. See Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 and 5, 1 through 3. But on the other hand, he was made perfect through the suffering and experiences of mortality in the sense that he thereby died and was resurrected in glorious immortality. In that perfected state, possessing at long last a body of flesh and bones, he then had the same eternal perfection possessed by the Father. Hence his pronouncement after the resurrection that all power was given him in heaven and in earth. The phrase, the author of our eternal salvation, meaning God the Father is the author of the plan of salvation, meaning that he ordained the plan whereby his spiritual children, Christ included, might have power to advance and become and progress like him. But Christ is the author in the sense that he adopted it and made it his own, in the sense that through his atoning sacrifice, he caused its terms and conditions to have eternal efficacy. E efficacy. Hebrews 5, 14, 11 through 14. Christ's ministers should advance beyond the milk of the word and be qualified to teach deep and hard doctrine. Instead of progressing in the Christian life, the reader has become spiritually sluggish and mentally lazy. They were not recent converts. Having taken the first steps toward becoming Christians, they had slipped back to where they had started. Chapter 5, verse 14, the phrase of full age meant those who had progressed in spiritual life and had become Christ, uh, had become Christians of sound judgment and discernment. Let us now turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Let us go on to perfection. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, what is meant by leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ? The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews 6 1 prevents a possible misconception when it states, therefore, not leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ. This church change supports the original Greek text of the phrase, which translates as having left behind the beginning of the doctrine. The saints dressed in Hebrews had already seen the first principles, ordinances, and doctrines of the gospel, including faith, repentance, baptism, and a laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were not to abandon those principles, but were to continue growing towards spiritual maturity from that beginning point. The Joseph Smith translation of Hebrews 6.3 also contains a significant addition, quote, and we will go on unto perfection if God permit. Chapter 6, verse 1, the doctrine of Christ, meaning the whole gospel plan, the whole system of salvation, the total arraignment whereby man can gain perfection and be like God, is five things. One, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Two, repentance. Three, baptism. Four, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and five, enduring in righteousness and devotion to the end. After setting this forth in detail with a special emphasis upon pressing forward in steadfastness and devotion after baptism, Nephi says, And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and the only true doctrine of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Second Nephi 32.21 let us go on to perfection, that phrase meaning the goal of the saints are finite perfection here and now and infinite perfection in the mansions on high. 
Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, crucifying the Son of God of flesh. See also Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. Hebrews 6 contains a warning to those who might abandon their faith in Christ and fall into personal apostasy. Hebrews 10, 21, 26 through 31 also hints at the consequences that await such actions. The writer of Hebrews used the phrase, crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, Hebrews 6, 6, to describe the actions of those who will not be forgiven because they turn from knowledge of the truth and will not repent. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, quote, Lucifer is perdition, and the one-third of the host of heaven who followed him are sons of perdition. Those in this life who gain a perfect knowledge of the divinity of the gospel cause, a knowledge that comes only by revelation from the Holy Ghost, and who then link themselves with Lucifer and come out in open rebellion, also become sons of perdition. Their destiny following the resurrection is to be cast out with the devil and his angels to inherit the same kingdom in a state where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. End of quote. Commission of the unpardonable sin consists in crucifying unto oneself the Son of God afresh and putting him to open shame. To commit this unpardonable crime, a man must receive the gospel, gain from the Holy Ghost by revelation the absolute knowledge of the divinity of Christ, and then deny the new and everlasting covenant by which he was sanctified, calling it unholy thing, and doing despite to and doing despite to the Spirit of grace. He thereby commits murder by assenting unto the Lord's death. That is, having a perfect knowledge of the truth, he comes out in open rebellion and places himself in a position wherein he would have crucified Christ, knowing perfectly that while he was the Son of God, Christ is thus crucified afresh and put to open shame. Hebrews 6, 7-8, Thorns and Briars. An abundance of thistles and thorns grew in the Holy Land, and they did not escape the figurative eye of Jesus and his apostles. Thistles and thorns serve only to afflict and annoy. The parable of the four kinds of soil has seeds falling among the thorns, while sprang up and choked the seeds. Those thorns represent the cares and pleasures of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Thorns do not symbolize anything good or positive in Scripture. Rather, that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Hebrews 6, 8. Hebrews 6, 11 and 18 through 19, which hope we have as an anchor to our soul. Paul wanted his readers to have hope. When we have hope, we trust God's promises. We have a quiet assurance that if we do the works of righteousness, we shall receive our reward, even peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. The principle of hope extends into the eternities, but it also can sustain you through the daily challenges of life. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the First Presidency drew upon numerous scriptural passages to teach about hope. Quote, hope is the gift of the Spirit. It is a hope that through the atonement of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection, we shall be raised unto eternal life, and thus because of our faith in Christ. This kind of hope is both the principle of promise as well as a commandment. And as with all commandments, we have the responsibility to make it an active part of our lives and overcome the temptation to lose hope. Hope in our Heavenly Father's merciful plan of happiness leads to peace, mercy, rejoicing, and gladness. The hope of salvation is like a protective helmet. It is the foundation of our faith, an anchor to our souls, the infinite power of hope. End of quote. Hebrews 6, verse 12, the phrase, Be not slothful, inherit the promises, Paul meant, 
the repeated promises of eternal life which God gives to his saints when they receive his everlasting covenant in connection with baptism through magnifying priesthood callings as part of celestial marriage, as part of patriarchal blessings, and when their calling and election is made sure. Hebrews six thirteen to 20 after patiently enduring, Abraham obtained the promise. Paul declared that when God made great promises to Abraham, he swore by himself. In ancient times, swearing with an oath was a formal part of the religious life of the people. Vel in Hebrews 6.19 is a reference to the veil of the temple. The high priest entered through the veil into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, to symbolically cleanse Israel. In the same way, Jesus, the great high priest, entered through the veil into heaven to prepare, uh, to, to prepare the way for us to return to. It was only after Abraham patiently endured that he obtained the promise made to him by Jehovah, which were immutable, meaning unalterable, and confirmed by an oath in which it was impossible for God to lie, which brought hope as an anchor to the soul. Ether 12.4 says, Wherefore, whoso believeth in God might with surety hope for a better world, yea, even a place at the right hand of God, which hope cometh of faith, maketh an anchor to the souls of men, which would make them sure and steadfast, always abounding in good works, being led to glorify God. Ending the quote. Knowing with a surety that you will attain God's kingdom, while here and all having that knowledge, that witness given to you by the Holy Ghost, certainly is an anchor to our souls and gives us hope through the trials that we've already learned must and will come immortality. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you did, hit the like button.